Okay, got an important video for you today. This one, I'm gonna go over the detailed pages of the machine sampler. So essential viewing and essential reading through the manual, but a lot of people don't like to do that. So here you go. This is Jeff's visual manual. So we're gonna go over all of these pages that you see here in the sampler menu. And this is kind of the fundamental building blocks of sound in machine. So realize you could take any sound of any sort whether it's you know sampling a beautiful hardware synthesizer or a virtual instrument and then tweaking it and making your own patches after it's been turned into audio or whether it's recording your own sounds and turning that as a building block into a sample or a synthesizer type patch. So if you want to see a really fun example of this, I did a video a long time ago that many of you haven't seen and that was where I recorded every sound in my house that made a vibration or a buzz or a hum that sounded like a B or a B flat. You'll find a lot of your electronics do that. Anyways, made a video recording all of those sounds, tweaking it in these settings here and then, you know, built it on the spot kind of thing. So go check that video out, really fun. These settings become a lot more important to people who are using Machine Plus, because a lot of times you're gonna have to take synth patches from your favorite synthesizers and turn them into sampled patches that you can then tweak. But the problem is if you use something like the Polybrute or a Moog synthesizer, you've got these beautiful filters, and as soon as you turn it into a sampled patch, you lose any kind of rhythmic LFOs that might change something according to the tempo of your project or your song. So all of these kinds of things we're gonna lose as soon as we turn it into a sampled patch, but we can gain all that stuff back with the sample menu if we use it properly. So we can use LFOs, we can use modulation envelopes, and we'll go over those in a little bit here. I'm also gonna be using my good friend Julian Pollock's patches in this video. So he's got patches available on his website, beautiful patches for things like the Arturia Stage 73 version 2, the Arturia OBXA, and then he's also got patches here for the OBXD, which is actually a free synthesizer, and he's got patches for free on here as well. And then we've also got uh, the samples that I'm going to be using in this one are from his sample pack that he made with Nicholas Semrad, another amazing keyboardist. And they've just got a whole bunch of great keyboard licks that you can then drop into your own productions. We'll try slicing some of those up in this video. This guy is probably one of the best synthesizer players or the best keyboardist in the world right now. He's Marcus Miller's keyboardist. And I also have a video where I interviewed the guy. So I talked to him on my show Beats and Chats. And then we also made a little beat, a song at the end of the video. So make sure you go watch that. It's those kind of videos take so much time. I love making them. But, uh, you know, I need the support of you guys to go watch those videos when I make them, just so the algorithm drives them out there. Because I do feel like a lot of people will benefit from listening to him talk, because I'm telling you, this guy is one of the best. So let's get right into the deep dive into the machine's sampler and all of the settings that it comes with. So if you're on a machine micro, just remember that all of the things I'm showing you on the hardware is available to you on the software. So all you have to do when you see me go to page one is you go to page one on the sampler settings right there. Got to make sure you are on the plugin button. So you click on the plugin button and then now we can see the sound settings all up here, the six pages. So I'm just going to go over to the browser here and I'll just show you uh, this J3PO and Nicholas Semrad sample pack just to see what it's all about. <laughs> So we got some clav loops, piano loops. Rhodes. It's beautiful playing in here. So let's take this little loop right here and we're just going to drop it right onto our sampler track right there. And I'm going to slice this up. Of course, I've got a video on sampling, slicing and stuff like that, but uh, we'll just go through this, do this real quick. We're going to mess with all six of these slices as sounds, but we're going to select them all first so that everything we do in this little sampler menu is going to happen to all of the samples at the same time. 
which is something you're going to want to do often because we're going to treat these as kind of like our own little synthesizer type thing. So I'm going to make one more patch here for us to flip back and forth between so that we have the ability to talk about other features of this sampler menu that might not apply to something like sample chops. And we're going to load up the OPXAV. Okay, so this is Arturia's instrument. And in this one, I do have the patches by Julian already set up here. So if I go over to my sound banks and go to J3PO, there we can see all of his patches. So let's just try some of these patches out and we'll see if we can find a good one to sample. Okay, this bass sounds really good. I kind of want to just go with that one. And just a little tip when you're sampling a patch, what you might want to do is say with something like a bass, it might be nice to start with a bass patch that has a little more high frequency content because then we can use the filter in the sampler section to get rid of some of those high frequencies, but we can't really add them back to a patch like this. So I'm going to go over to this, this patch itself and just check the filter to see what it's doing. That sounds pretty good. So now we've got a, a bit more of a buzzy patch, which I'm going to sample, and then I'm going to filter it down a little bit to get it warmer to where Julian already had this patch. So that sounds great. I'm going to go through and auto sample this, put you to my auto sampling video uh, for this details on this. I'm not going to talk about that right now, but let me just go sample that. Okay, so now I've got my sampled patch. You can see it stretched out on either side. Here's the original. So we're good to go for our sampled patch. And as you can see, this is a sampler that we're in, but sampler in machine is a lot more powerful than people think in terms of you can have multiple zones, you can have multiple notes on one sampled sound, and you can have also multiple velocities. So there's a whole lot there that uh, doesn't get tapped into as much as it probably should. And we're going to switch between these two patches. We've got our samples. And then we've got a sampled instrument. So we'll start right at page one. We've got voice settings, polyphony is set to eight. That means I could have all of them playing at the same time if I want to. Well, it's a bass patch. I'm probably going to want to keep that to either one. So when it gets to the next note, it cuts it off. So if I go back to keyboard mode, you hear that it doesn't allow more than one note to be played at the same time. And then of course you can crank this up to as many voices as you want, but you're usually going to be going something like one legato or a whole bunch of voices. So if I set this to legato versus one, that means when I play a note, kind of like a monophonic synthesizer now. And we can determine how the note slides up to the next note. So if we turn slide, it's like portamento on a synthesizer. So again, we're just adding all of the controls that we'd have on a synthesizer to a sampled patch. Now you can hear it's taking 0.87 seconds to get to that note. Even that's a little too much, but just a little bit gives you that. So legato is really important for monophonic synth type patches that you want to have a bit of a slide between and works really nicely with the bass. One thing that's weird about the pitch bend is it's set to three semitones. I'm not sure why. I usually have pitch bend set to two semitones or my sort of favorite is 12 semitones, a really fun pitch bend, especially when you're on the keyboard. So I do that with more with synth leads maybe than bass, but uh, it's a lot of fun. Next, we've got the engine. And in this case, this allows you to change the quality of the sampler itself and to go back to some of the more classic sounds of uh, the old Akai samplers. So let's see what happens if we go to a sample and we'll change the mode. Let's get kind of grainy. 
just adding some noise to it and I guess making it a little bit more lo-fi. I usually leave it on standard and then use other effects if I want to add some lo-fi to it. Next, we've got the pitch and gate section. So this is page two. You can go in and take your samples and just change the tuning. So I can go up by semitones. Uh, I like to use this if I'm using a sample that's been recorded but is slightly out of tune. But this is also the time where I will go and take individual chords and change the pitch of those. So in this case I've got some really neat chords in here. But what if I want some more chords out of these little slices? Well it's pretty easy to do. I'm going to go select none because they're all selected right now. And I'm just going to take one of these chords. So let's take this sample right here. We're going to paste it onto sound seven. And we're going to pitch this one up just one semitone. So now we've got... Okay, so I got a little idea here. And just remember that you can go and change the pitch of individual sounds or of the whole thing. And so on my bass patch, if I was playing with the tuning, I might have to go in and do some micro adjustments to the tuning itself. Or if the note itself, if I go into the keyboard and I play the C, and it's not a C, if it's something else, then that's where I would go instead of just going, okay, let's just, you know, start this off on like an E flat or something. I like to have these notes here match up with what the note actually is. So you go over to the sound menu and you adjust your tuning so that that note is actually a C. All right, just some really quick, easy things. We've got the start time. That's just the start of the sample. If I go over to my slices, Maybe we want to mess with the start of that one. Now you can hear it's kind of cutting into that sample a little bit later. Got a bit of a click. We can add a slightly longer attack. And we get rid of that little pop at the beginning. So we'll get back to that in a second. But that's the start of the sample. We can also reverse samples. You know what, these ones all might be kind of fun if we reverse all of them. Ooh, that's really neat. I wonder what would happen if we mess with the start time on these. Let's go start a lot later. Okay, so for this next thing, I want to talk about ADSR and one shot. And I've loaded up another sample. Another one from J3PO. And so when you have it set to one shot on a sample like this, it's just going to play it. And a lot of times that's exactly what you want. Other times you want it to play only when you hold it down. And so we've got two options here. One is AHD, which stands for attack, hold, and decay. And it's showing you how quickly it's coming in, which is right away. And it's only holding for a quarter of a second. So let's crank that up. And then as soon as it hits that 2.8 seconds, it's just going to drop out according to how fast this decay setting is set to. I will almost always go to ADSR because I want all four of these classic envelope controls. So I've got a little diagram here of ADSR. And I've got a great video on synthesizer synthesis basics. Make sure you watch that if this stuff is all kind of new to you. But here we can see attack, decay, sustain, release. And so you can see the attack is the amount of time when you hold down a note, how quickly is that sound coming in? And the decay is going to determine how quickly does the sound decay or drop down to the sustain level. So attack is time, decay is time, how much time it takes to get to the sustain level. And then sustain is a level. So we can see that according, they've got it just set to either one as maximum or down to zero. So that's one up top and zero all, all the way at the bottom. If your sustain is set to one, your decay is going to be completely meaningless because there is no drop in level. So watch what happens here. 
nothing really changes at the beginning of the sound. If I drop my sustain level, we're going to hear it drop down after the initial attack and this initial quarter of a second decay. And there's the sustain level. It's kind of quiet. This is a really weird one to show it on, but I think it's actually probably going to make more sense. Watch, I'm just going to make my decay a little bit longer. Now really long. And it's taking longer to drop down to that lower sustain level. And then the release, when you take your finger off, how quickly does it stop playing the sample? 627, now a full second. You're decaying out. So a lot of times you might want that release really quick so that it's just, as soon as you let your finger off, the sample stops. So same thing with this bass here. So right now it's a 217 millisecond release. If I crank that really fast, here it stops immediately. Why would I want a sustain that's lower than one? It's because you can craft um, an attack of your sound to be maybe quite aggressive at the beginning and then drop down to a more subtle level. So it's not something that is makes a lot of sense, but it is something that can give you creative control over your synthesizer sounds. And the fact that we've got this built in the sampler is just so nice because it means you can do all the synthesis type stuff to your samples and treat them like a real synthesizer. And let's see what happens now if I set the sustain. So now I've got the boom, boom sort of thing happening. And then I can also set the attack to be longer. So it's going to take a while to get up to that top level and then drop down to the sustain level and then drop off when I release the note. Let's make it even longer. Now you can really hear that swell up and then drop down to the sustain level. Another thing I should mention in this point, did you notice how, watch what happens with this little amplitude envelope. If I move to the next note without releasing the other one or if it's legato, we don't actually hear the amplitude envelope. Watch what happens if I release the note. Now watch play it again. Legato. You hear that it's connecting the notes and it's not playing that uh, this whole amplitude envelope that we've got programmed in here. And that's because my voice setting is set to legato. Watch what happens if I set this to one. Now we hear that envelope every time. So now it's starting to make sense what these different voice settings, these polyphony settings are actually doing. We've got our, our amplitude envelope, which is an extremely essential part of synthesis. Go watch my synthesizer basics video for more info on that stuff. On page three, we've got a compressor. We've got some drive. We've got sample rate reduction, bit rate reduction, and then a filter. First one, effects, compressor. Right now we've got uh, a whole bunch of samples, so I want to select all of them. Select and all. And then we're going to set this compressor on here so that everything gets a little bit louder. So now we're getting a little bit uh, more of a consistent level. And then we have drive here as well, which we can add some distortion. Let's try it on our bass batch. That's actually giving us a little bit more of that brightness that I was talking about before, which we could then go and mess with on the filter later on. So I'm going to leave that on. It sounds pretty good. We've also got sample rate reduction. Really lo-fying things up. We've got bit rate reduction, which sounds different. adding some of that noise in there. And then we've got the filter section over here. So this is where things get a little bit more exciting for making your own synthesizer patches. We've got a filter and it says LP2, BP2, HP2, and EQ. So another little graphic for you right here, we've got this low pass filter, high pass filter, and a band pass filter. So the low pass filter, if you look at this little diagram here, you can imagine this is frequencies from low to high. And a low pass filter allows low frequencies to go through and it cuts out high frequencies. That's why this little diagram goes like this. High pass filter does the opposite, allows 
high frequencies through, cuts out the low frequencies. And then we've also got a bandpass filter. The bandpass filter only allows a range of frequencies through. So it's going to cut the lows and the highs, but it will allow you to move that band around, which can get some really cool results. So let's go look at the, the bass patch here. And we're going to put a filter on. It will start with the low pass filter. We've got a cutoff of one kilohertz. So that's saying somewhere at around one kilohertz, this thing is going to kick in and cut frequencies. There probably isn't a whole lot of frequencies past one kilohertz. Let's turn it off. So it gets brighter. Watch what happens as we move this cutoff frequency down. So we're actually going to move this line over to the left. Right? So that's that sound of, of reducing or cutting out frequencies. Remember I said initially the patch had this really warm tone. With the filter we can now get rid of those high frequencies but have the option later on to control this cutoff and to actually make those frequencies come back if we want. We can then also choose a bandpass filter which is this one in the middle and we're going to just move that big bump around from left to right. And then we've got a high pass filter which is this one here allowing the high frequencies but cutting out the low frequencies. And the resonance is a weird one. It adds a bump right at the point where the frequency drops down or either in a high pass or a low pass. So you can think of this one adds a little bump right here and then it drops down. So it really ends up exaggerating the sound of a filter. So if we go back to low pass filter and crank up the resonance. Versus resonance down. So it really adds that nasal quality. A really another really important parameter. Also something I go into extensively in my synthesizer video. So go check that one out. So we are on page four now. Modulation envelope. Modulation envelope is another really cool thing. Is that we have the ability, just like my synthesizer here, the Polybrute has a modulation envelope. So it's got ADSR, Attack, Decay, Sustain, Release settings, which we can then apply to any parameter on the Polybrute. Well, you can do the same thing on the machine hardware or in the machine software. So here you can see again, Attack, Decay, Sustain, Release, but then we get to dis decide where that is going. Let's start with the pitch. So we're going to crank this up so that 100% of whatever we decide to do here is going to assign to our pitch parameter. So watch what happens when I play a note. Not a whole lot. And that's because our sustain is already set to maximum. So it's like this line is already at the very top. Watch what happens if we set our sustain to like 0.5. We're going to hear a really quick attack, so nothing at the beginning. But we're going to hear the pitch sort of decay down to a different level. Now watch what happens if we change that decay to be a little bit longer. So the note you're hearing is whatever the sustain level is set at. Because remember, this sustain is always a level. So right now our level is 0.5, whatever that means. And right now I'm actually playing a G. And that's actually the note that we're hearing. So a sustain level of 0 gives us a G. Sustain level of 1 gives us an octave higher. Julian Pollock. He does some really cool stuff with chords where he has a chord that when you play it, you hear this like whoa, whoa, whoa. Every time he plays a chord, you get this really cool effect with, uh, with the pitch. Feeling like we could maybe recreate that. I'm going to go over to page one. We're going to set this to four voices. And then I'm going to go over to page four. I'm going to crank this down to uh, zero. And let's set the decay to something a little bit different. Actually, let's set it to a uh, chord set. And look what happens if we set the attack. It's actually going to slide up and then slide down to the sustain level. And now let's set the sustain level to a full octave up and then let's take our chords down an octave. So pretty cool stuff, this, uh, this modulation envelope assigning to the pitch. So this is another major purpose of something like a modulation envelope is assigning to the cutoff. We need to put a filter on for starters. So I'm going to go to low pass filter. Great. 
So now we can hear the cutoff right here. Let's crank this way down. And we'll crank the resonance up so it's a little more obvious. When I have this modulation assigned to the cutoff, let's see what, if we, what happens if we play with it a bit. Let's change the attack so it kicks in faster. And it's going to full sustain level. So it's going up. And then it's hitting the stain level because this and this decay is doing nothing at this point. If I want the decay to do something, I would bring the sustain level down to some other number. So now we can hear it going up, hitting the decay, coming down, and then hitting the sustain level. So we can make that a lot faster. So now you can hear fast decay. Now let's go a little faster attack. And that's just by using a modulation envelope, an envelope onto the cutoff of the filter. So a really important one for you to mess around with. We can also assign it to the drive. That one just adds more distortion over time uh, with the envelope. But let's go over to this pan one, which will be a little bit more obvious on this patch. If I set this to 100%, it's going to start left and then move right or vice versa. So it's really quickly going from right to left. Now it's going a little slower. And then the sustain level is going to determine where it ends up. So at zero, it kind of moves over to the right and then comes back to the middle. At one, it moves over to the right speaker. Now watch what happens if we take pan and move it to a negative value. It does the opposite. It goes over to the left side. On page five, we've got the LFO, and this is probably one of the most important things to get your brain around. Again, go watch my synthesizer basics video. I keep plugging that, but it's so important. It goes over all of these basics, but let's just quickly see if we can get our brain around this so you can start messing around with this one as well. Again, on the left side, we've got the LFO parameters, and then we've got where we are sending that LFO. And that's the thing with LFOs on synthesizers. You always have a million places you can send this changing pulsing thing too. And in this case, what we want to do is we want to send a pulsing signal to a parameter such as pitch. So we can send a pulse that's going to go way, or change the pitch over time, or the cutoff over time, or the drive, just add more distortion over time. Again, not something I use very much, or the pan, left, right, back and forth, going between the speakers. And you can choose to send that back and forth signal as a sine wave, which is nice and smooth, or as a triangle wave, which is going to be a little bit more angular. You can also use the rect. So that one gives you the ability to have a square wave. So it's like on, off, on, off. So the filter's on, then the filter's off. The filter's on, filter's off. But you can choose that over time, how quickly that's happening. Then we've also got saw wave and random. Let's just try these with the pitch so that you can get your brain around this. So hold down a note. And right now it's panning left to right. The speed is determining how quickly it's moving left to right. I have a filter on, I need to get rid of that. You can also choose the phase. And that's just going to change where it starts. And then the sync, we can go retrig, and we can set that now to quarter notes, which is great. So this LFO is useless if we can't sync it to the tempo of our song, but of course we can do that here. So if we have it set to retrig, it's going to sync to the tempo of our song every time we hit a note down, or we can have it set to lock. And that's just going to lock to the, the quarter notes of your song. And if you leave it set to free, you're just going to be going by hertz, which is just a certain amount of cycles per second. So it's a lot less useful in terms of a rhythmic thing that maybe you want tied to your project. We could do the same thing with pitch. Let's set the pitch to 100%. Okay, so sine wave makes sense. Now let's try a different wave. Triangle wave. 
very similar. This sort of stays at the top and the bottom of a sine wave a little bit longer just because of the shape. We go to rectangle or square, and that gives us this pulsing siren. So up, down, according to quarter notes. Then we have saw. So that one starts high and then drops down slowly. Jumps up, drops down slowly. And then we can reverse the pitch, and now it's going to go the other way. Right? And then the last thing, page six, we've got velocity destination and mod wheel destination. If you play hard on a chord, do you want something to change? What can you change? Well, you can change the volume. So that 100% means if I play soft, it's going to play the chord back soft. If I play hard, it plays loud or a full volume. You can also invert that, I guess, so that if you played hard, it plays soft, I guess. Meh. Never done that, but hey, you know, maybe that's cool. Cut off. Let's crank that up and turn the filter on. Don't forget to turn the filter on if you're going to do any of this kind of stuff. So as I play softer, it's doing less of the filter. We can also assign it to our decay, decide how quickly it's going to decay down to the sustain level according to your velocity. I don't know, I can't come up with a great one for that one, but start makes sense too. Of course, you can you can start at different points of your sample according to your velocity. Yeah, maybe you might. Let's crank that up and see what happens. So if I play soft, it plays the whole sample. If I play hard, it doesn't play all of it. It moves the start time over. That'd be an interesting one. And the last thing we've got is the mod wheel destination. And that's where you get to choose, uh, you know, the start time of the sample with the mod wheel. Keep triggering it at different points. For cutoff, let's set it to 100%. And then now I've got it set to mod wheel right here. Set it to opposite. You can hear it going the other way. So now you're going to have to go over to your filter and change where the cutoff happens. Right? So even though it's a low pass filter, it's like it's working in opposite direction. And then we've also got on the last page, we've got pan, and we can set that to 100%. So there's a ton of stuff in there, the sampler menu, but what it allows you to do is take sampled patches that you've captured, whether you're using the auto sampler and capturing other synthesizers, just capturing one single note and then being able to turn that into a synthesizer patch or whether you're triggering actual samples, you know? We can use the sampler settings to completely change those kinds of sounds as well. So it's a really important thing to understand with machine. And I think the beauty of this device is how simple it is to access those kinds of things. And that's what makes it so much fun to use because you can so quickly get to the filter. You can so quickly get to the LFO and change the most obvious things that you might want to change on a synthesizer patch. So hope it was useful for you. Hit the subscribe button and the bell, and we'll see you in the next video.